Michael. Let's start. Uh, welcome to the course of Control over the Robots. This course has been uh, uh, designed to give uh, PhD students in robotics a base uh, common knowledge to know all the tricks, all the basic uh, uh, knowledge to be able to develop new research in locomotion. So uh, the first part of the course is related to control, while there is a, another course that will be probably done in uh, autumn uh, that will be dealing with uh, optimization, numerical optimization applied to uh, trajectory planning. So the first part, uh, with this first part, you will be able to uh, actually um, design a controller uh, that is able to control the stability of our well-legged robots. So we will start from basic uh, um, fixed base manipulator joint controller and we increase the complexity to floating base robots controllers. Uh, as I said, in the second part of the, cor uh, the course in autumn, I will talk mainly uh, on uh, modeling, for example, uh, 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 reduced models like in linear inverted pendulum and central dynamics that uh, uh, researcher in the uh, locomotion community use to as, as models to uh, use in optimization problems to define a trajectory optimization uh, for locomotion. Uh, <coughs> so some prerequisites for this course are um, having some basic knowledge on Newtonian dynamics, uh, uh, 3D, Lagrangian mechanics, uh, basic kinematics, robotics like the Jacobians, and uh, having some uh, um, uh, familiarity with the coordinate system transforms. Um, also some basic knowledge on linear algebra, uh, ordinary differential equations, state space model, linear systems, because we, we're going to talk about uh, the dynamics of, the, of this, this kind of systems. So, um, and then also some um, knowledge on eigenvector, eigenvalues, rank, and space, uh, uh, what is a positive depth matrix, and, and that's it. I suggest you to, if you have some uh, lack of knowledge in this, to uh, read this book, which is very, very good. Uh, there are also online lectures on this. Uh, and as I said, for control system, uh, um, state space representation, and uh, some uh, uh, stability criteria. Uh, this is the syllabus of the course. Uh, uh, in the, it's, there are many three parts. Uh, I think this week we will be able to uh, talk only about this or starting to talk about this. So uh, first, there is a, uh, the first part is about uh, fixed base robots. Uh, this means uh, going from the different uh, controllers uh, and also talk about the singularity and uh, uh, redundancy and uh, also uh, arriving to our, uh, talk about the orientation control, which is a topic that uh, is, can be tricky because of the presentation of the orientation, that there are many different orientations possible. Then I will extend uh, uh, in the second week uh, to floating base robots. So uh, I still don't know uh, how deep to go into this, so uh, the detail uh, I will explain, it will depend also on the speed. It's the first time, actually it's the second, but it's the first time I'm Second in total, but it's the first time I do this course in Italy, and uh, I need to. It's, it's a kind of experiment, so you're the, <laughs> the test <laughs> uh, to give me feedback. Also, uh, please, uh, on whatever is not clear, whatever could be explained in uh, more detail, or slower, or faster. And uh, finally, the most uh, the third part is about uh, designing the controller for the floating base robots. Uh, that we, def we model in this, in this week. Um, so uh, these controllers will be uh, simple, uh, starting from a simple case where wherever we use a projection-based approach and then uh, extend it to a uh, QP formulation, so a controller that is cast as, a, as an optimization problem where we are able, for example, to optimize for the ground direction forces and the friction cones implements some, some constraints. Um, and then more uh, advanced uh, QP-based controller with the full dynamics. So we start with a simple quasi-static formulation to arrive to the full uh, floating-based dynamics uh, controller. Uh, there are some lab, sesh, 
lab sessions. Uh, again, as we, we will see uh, uh, how to do them. I would like to do at the end of the theoretical presentation, such that we are able to uh, crystallize, solidify the, the knowledge we get into the theory and put into practice. These lab sessions are um, five. They are, they are mainly uh, Python code that is already written. So there is a, a file that is called uh, lab one uh, no solution that you can fill in, and there is one with the solution, so you can you can still run the code and uh, understand it. If, check if you if you if you did it properly, um, and these uh, are related to the to the classes. So one lab on fixed base joint control, another lab on fixed base operation space control, where we talk about controlling the end factor, closing the loop at the end factor, and then uh, a lab on constraint uh, dynamics. So. We will show how to build a simulator. So we have a robot, the model of the robot, and we want to uh, simulate and uh, compute the, the, the dynamics whenever the robot gets in contact with the environment. And then we extend to, we will show some properties of the, of the floating base dynamics. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the quasi static approach controller that I told you before to control the central mass and the trunk of the robot. Uh, uh, in a, with a projection based approach and a, um, a QP approach. Uh, as I said, uh, the software tool you can uh, download the virtual machine uh, in the lab, our uh, lab uh, web course. Um, web page, uh, I still don't know. Um, uh, the, web, the virtual machine works with the uh, Ubuntu 16, but uh, I'm, I, will, I think I will update for a version that works also with Ubuntu 18. Um, I didn't have time to <laughs> deeply uh, get into that. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, um, directly download the, the uh, repository of the of the labs and uh, uh, install them on your Ubuntu machine uh, uh, following the lab instructions with me. These are the uh, organization of the lectures. We will be mainly in the afternoon to don't overlap with other courses that might be of your interest. So I did a um, an intersection <laughs> of my course with the other one, um, except this day that is in the morning. So uh, here we'll give you a, a quick introduction of, about who am I. Uh, I am a researcher at the Dynamic Legal System Lab uh, here at IT. Uh, I work um, in quadruped robots since 2010, and I was um, mainly involved at the beginning in control and then in locomotion and planning. Uh, during my PhD, I implemented a whole body control that uh, was able to walk into this uh, V-shaped world. So you had to actually, we, this will be the output of our course here. The could be based controller is exactly what I did uh, back in 2013, 14. Uh, then during the postdoc, I was uh, mainly uh, interested to uh, heuristic approach for locomotion. So what it meant to do to uh, traverse a terrain with uh, big stones, uh, uneven terrain, uh, uh, terrain uh, elevation changes, uh, uh, inclined terrain, uh, uh, rocks on the, uh, on the flat terrain. So um, all the strategies that you need to apply to address this kind of terrain. Um, then uh, during my research uh, contracts, I was doing other stuff. Uh, implementing, extending the whole body control to a compliant uh, uh, a software in whole body control that takes into account the compliance of the environment. And finally, uh, start to use optimization uh, in an NPC fashion to the plant trajectory online during locomotion. Uh, I was also defining some new um, strategies uh, that are called, uh, for planning that are called feasible regions, that are two regions that allows you to plan trajectory simply in, a, in an easy way, in an intuitive way, uh, that if you put the center of mass in this, in this kind of region, you have guarantees of not violating friction cones, uh, actuation constraints, and kinematic fields. So it's uh, quite, uh, quite nice and fast to be computed. Uh, you can find some resources online. Some of them um, are not free. Some of them are free. Uh, and you can check uh, both of the uh, first part and the second part. Uh, for the slide notation, whenever you find a, a plus, it means that there is an advantage. Um, talking about an advantage, otherwise 
a minus is a disadvantage of a comps. Uh, this symbol here is definition. Whenever you find this, it's a local reference to a paper. Try to put uh, in the final slide of each lecture uh, the references to the paper or the books uh, you can uh, uh, consult to, to get information. Uh, it was hard to put together all the information because, especially in the second part of the course, uh, there are no books on these topics and I had to merge many, many different papers. And so um, it, it, it's a big effort uh, uh, to, to find references for the second part. But for the first part, uh, it's mostly school books, so um, it's OK. Uh, whenever you find this symbol, it's optional slide. So these are slides that are for in-depth study. They are not part of the exam. Um, Sometimes they are hidden in the PPT presentation, so I will not show them, but you can find it uh, uh, in the PDF uh, uh, that I upload on our web. Uh, <coughs> and this slide means all means optional, of course. For the math notation, uh, just, just to, 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 to agree on this, uh, when I show this, it's, it's like an identity matrix. Uh, 3 times 3. Uh, this is the uh, skew symmetric uh, matrix uh, associated to the cross product of A times. Um, whenever we talk about the frame, we, we, we mean uh, both the origin and orientation of the frame. Uh, this is the coordinate of a point P expressed with respect to a frame uh, W. And this is the rotation matrix uh, that uh, starts forming uh, a 3D vector. Uh, from the frame B uh, into uh, a frame W. Um, this uh, uh, particular notation is uh, the position of a point uh, B, uh, sorry, of a point uh, B with respect to A uh, expressed in W. So this is a vector from A to B expressed in W. And this is the inertia of a body. Uh, after thinking a lot, I decided to, to, to design the variable for the inertia this way, to not confuse with the uh, spatial inertia. Um, so this is the tensor of inertia of a body I expressed in the, in the frame W. And then when I talk about the range, I consider a, a 60 force. So uh, um, linking to spatial algebra, uh, a 60 vector where you have a linear component and a regular component. Uh, <coughs> whenever uh, we talk about uh, uh, joint uh, links and links, uh, frame links, um, we have, uh, for example, one joint uh, uh, connecting uh, the link by, with the link i plus 1. And uh, um, <coughs> the link frame uh, usually uh, it's moving uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the link, so this red. Uh, uh, frame we move the, with this body, which is a rigid body, and uh, it's um, as the origin coincident with the supporting joint. So this is the joint frame, and this is the link frame. While the joint frame is normally defined with a rigid uh, transformation with respect to the predecessor link. Okay, this is the way, uh, standard way, uh, kinematic tree is modeled. Uh, nowadays in robotics, there are different ways. I choose this one. Uh, okay. First lecture, we talk about uh, fixed base robots, as you said, for the whole week. Um, fixed base robots are the kind of robots that, uh, um, uh, example of them are industrial manipulators, whatever the base is fixed, and uh, there is uh, usually a single end effector moving in the air. Um, 
uh, uh, the, the easiest way to control these kind of robots is uh, designing a control or of their joints. So we talk uh, initially about joint motion control. What do we, what do we mean uh, with control? Uh, control means that we need to find a, a pattern, a time history for the torques uh, that uh, we want to send to the actuators of the robot in order to execute a task. For example, move the end effector to a certain position. We, have, uh, we can have different kind of controller. Well, well, the, the simplest one, let's say, is called open loop control. There is no uh, feedback. We have our trajectory generator, which is a module outside that provides us with a reference trajectory of the position. So this is a joint position, uh, desired trajectory, velocity, and acceleration. And we, pa we can, for example, uh, uh, pass this to uh, the robot model and uh, compute the torque. This, this approach is called, called computer torque approach. That's no feedback. And the problem, of course, is that if you have disturbances or you have a model inaccuracies, you have, you're going to have tracking error. It means that your, your, traje your real trajectory will be drifting away uh, from uh, the desired one. But we will see that uh, a feed forward term together with a feedback part, it actually includes a lot of tracking. So we put this on hold for now. And the second uh, uh, type, of course, is uh, feedback control. Whatever, uh, wherever we uh, feedback uh, the velocity and the position of the robot uh, into a controller. Um, so we measure this uh, through sensors that can be at the joint level, for example, encoders to measure the positions. And then normally what people do is to differentiate the, um, the position of the encoder measured by the encoder uh, to get the velocity. And then the other input are the reference trajectory that we define from project generation uh, level. Um, and in this case, the controller can be either uh, decentralized. Uh, this is what people like to do because it's simple, because they uh, are able, for example, to um, embed uh, the controller in a, in a firmware, in a board that is located on the joint. So the, 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 the actuator itself does the uh, sensor reading and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the control giving a desired uh, reference, for example, in position, or uh, centralized control. And the centralized control is it's the most advanced one because it takes into account the interactions between the joints. Because if one joint moves, it will affect, uh, for example, the other on the, on the kinematic chain, actually, the, the, um, in both directions. So, uh, Either the distal one moves and it affects the, 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 uh, the closer joint, joint the closer to the root, then also the other way around. Uh, in, in, in the case of central control, we are able to deal with this interaction, interaction so we are able to achieve uh, better tracking accuracy. And whenever the, uh, the, uh, the, the desired trajectory is constant, we talk about regulator no, control. Just now. Uh, side detail. Um, for, uh, to define a controller, we need some specifications, and these specifications can be expressed either in the frequency domain, for example. Uh, in this case, we talk about uh, requirements on the bandwidth, uh, which is the highest frequency uh, of a sinusoid that, that can be tracked on the controller, or in the time domain. And we here we have mainly uh, three parameters, which are the the rise time from going to the from the 10% to the 90% of the reference, the time needed to, to, to do this transition. Uh, the settling time, which is uh, how long does it take uh, the system to achieve the 90% of the of the reference, and also the overshoot, which is the amount of, of overshoot of about the reference. It will be a stressing percentage sometimes. Uh, and to, uh, before uh, talking about uh, uh, controllers, let me do a little, um, a little uh, the tour on, uh, on um, recording the spring mass numbers, dynamics, um, that is useful for, for next uh, development. Uh, 
uh, a spring mass damper uh, model is, is defined like this. We have a mass that is um, attached uh, to a reference uh, to a spring and a damper. We have an external force, and the, and the dynamic equation of this uh, model is, is the following. Uh, that can be, uh, if we put everything on the left, this is the input force, and this is the, the, the position, the velocity, and acceleration of the, of the mass, and this is the equation of a, a second order linear system. To study the motion uh, of this, the trajectory uh, of this, um, of this model, uh, we need to uh, solve the differential equation. Uh, we know that uh, we can, uh, uh, setting the input to zero, study the transient. So this is the natural dynamics. What happens whenever we, uh, the, how, how the, the system behaves whenever we move away from the, uh, from a certain initial condition. Sorry, we set, when we set the, a certain initial condition, let the system evolve naturally. And this is the, the way uh, the, uh, the trajectory behaves, it's a linear system. We have two eigenvalues values because they are second order system that are the roots of the characteristic equations. Written like that. And uh, these eigenvalues, values, uh, we see that uh, uh, sorry, they have uh, a real part that is always uh, uh, negative. This means that, that such a system is always stable because the poles have real part in the left plane of the. Uh, and uh, uh, according to the uh, whatever it was under this, uh, the, the argument of the root of square root, we can have a, a different uh, um, kind of eigenvalues. In particular, if uh, the denominator is lower than zero, uh, we have uh, uh, two complex number, two complex conjugate solutions, uh, where uh, that result in an uh, oscillatory response. And this happens whenever d is lower than uh, two square of nk. Otherwise, whenever this, uh, the argument of the root of the square root is zero, the two solutions uh, are coincident and uh, they are real because we said it, it was the real part was so the, um, it was negative. Um, and we have a, a, a critical event system, so we have no overshoot. While in this case we have an overshoot. Uh, while if the argument of the square root is bigger than zero. Uh, we have uh, uh, two real solutions, uh, this, this, um, this joint solution, so it, they are different. And uh, uh, we still have um, uh, an overshoot, uh, but uh, the, the behavior is slightly different. So in, in here, in essence, in essence, it's uh, behaving as a first order system, while here it's, um, you, you see a different uh, uh, plexus in the, in, the, in the dynamics. In the case of uh, uh, an input that is non, uh, non zero, uh, we have a, we have a, um, we, are, we have that, that uh, since the system is stable, it's going to a certain uh, uh, stability uh, point that it can be computed from the input this way, and it will go with the same behavior as before, uh, according to the uh, fact if the square root uh, argument to the square root is lower than zero, we have underdumped uh, conjugate poles, otherwise uh, uh, coincident roots. Uh, critically damped behavior and lower damped. Uh, if uh, we uh, divide for the mass, uh, we can underline uh, actually the usual uh, equation of a second order system where we can uh, compute, for example, the natural frequency and the critical, uh, the natural damping ratio. Sorry. Uh, to compute the natural frequency, we equate this uh, to. Uh, Sorry, yeah, this is a square, so omega n squared. And uh, uh, so we see that the natural frequency is related to the stiffness of the, of the, of the string. So the stiffer the string, the uh, faster the, the system oscillates. And the, um, the damping ratio, uh, it's, it can be computed from uh, uh, this term and uh, uh, as this, uh, this shape. And this damping ratio can go between uh, uh, 0 and 1, where 0 is 0 damping. And one is critically done. Um, uh, so whenever the, the system is critically done, we, we see the solution uh, that we, we found before that d is equal to uh, um, sorry this goes out of the two square root of kn is an error. 
we can uh, uh, see that whenever the uh, system is underdumped, we have, a, as we said, an unsultatory um, response, but the frequency of the, of the response is not natural frequency, but it's uh, slightly uh, lower. So this means that the period is longer than the one you would compute with the natural frequency. So the damping, in essence, uh, slows down the, 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 the oscillatory response. And mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that uh, whenever you don't have any damping, the system oscillates forever, bouncing back the energy from the mass, from transforming the kinetic energy into potential energy of the spring, and then uh, release it back to potential kinetic energy again. Uh, while uh, if you have a damper, it is a dissipative element uh, with time, it will slow down. So the first uh, uh, easiest controller uh, that you can think about is the PD controller. Uh, let's think about uh, a joint um, uh, with a link, so one degree of freedom robot, that is moving on a plane uh, perpendicular to gravity. Okay? So gravity has no influence on, uh, on, uh, on this system, and we have one rotational joint. The dynamics is very simple, it's the inertia, uh, of, of, of this link with respect to this axis uh, times the acceleration, uh, rotational acceleration uh, equal to torque. And the PD idea is to create a virtual spin damper uh, to drive the link uh, toward the desired position uh, uh, that we want, uh, the target. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the control law uh, equation that we want to set. So we have a proportional term and a derivative term the desired position for the ring, also desired velocity. And if we close the loop, uh, so that's, that means we insert that, um, that input torque into the dynamics, we get this expression. And if you want to check the, um, what happens at steady state, we set velocity and acceleration to zero, and we see that the, the the angle uh, of the link uh, really goes uh, to uh, the desired value. And uh, since, since the system is, uh, is a stable system because we are using the uh, string and bumpers, and we said that the system is stable, uh, as long as they are positive, because if you put a negative damper, it's unstable, it means it converts exponentially to uh, intermediate. But um, this uh, um, Apart from the steady state, uh, um, we can do uh, we, we have we can have some tracking errors during the transient, and uh, a way to improve the tracking uh, during the transient uh, is to add a feed forward term. A feed forward term it's like a torque that um, is proportional to the uh, to the. Uh, uh, Let's say we, we compute the desired acceleration, we multiply for the inertia, and we provide this torque already given, such that ideally, if you don't have any uh, external disturbance or model uh, inaccuracy, we go back to the computed torque, and, uh, and the, the tracking should be perfect. So we relieve, uh, um, with, with a forward term, we will be, in an ideal world, we will be able to, uh, to uh, achieve a perfect tracking, but whenever we have uh, uh, some problems, some disturbance, some, uh, some errors, some friction, some model dynamics, uh, the feedback part uh, uh, kicks in and, uh, and drives the error to zero. Um, but the fact that it provides this allows us to set lower gains. So if we want to achieve good tracking but still uh, don't be too stiff, set too high gains, uh, the forward term is it's something that uh, uh, it, it's useful for this. And if we set a, a, this kind of, uh, of control law in the, in the dynamics, we see that um, we, we port everything to the left hand side. We see that here we have the, the acceleration, uh, the, the second derivative of the tracking error. This is the tracking error, and this is the first derivative of the tracking error. This means that the dynamics of the error uh, converges to zero. And uh, we know that the transient mainly depends on these three terms, which is uh, inertia mm -hmm. and the KP and KD of our, of our controller. So 
uh, if we know the link inertia, for example, from SCAD values, we are able to uh, define tracking performances uh, uh, selecting the uh, values for the gains Kp and Kd, which is the proportional and derivative gains. And here we have an example, uh, of, for example, of, um, of a link of, uh, uh, with this uh, inertia. And we want to achieve a settling time of uh, two seconds. Um, for a second order system, uh, if you, if you as actually you have a closed form uh, so, um, solution of the trajectory, um, you, you, you can actually find a relationship between the settling time and the, uh, and the, and the omega n. So uh, in essence, uh, we can find that settling time is uh, four times uh, divide uh, the damping ratio and the natural frequency. Uh, so if we set a, a if we set a, a damping ratio uh, uh, of of one, uh, which means a critical damping uh, that people normally like to to do because they don't want to overshoot whenever they they achieve the reference uh, in robotics. Uh, we can find uh, the value of the natural frequency to achieve uh, this uh, uh, setting time of two seconds, which is two rad per second. And from this, uh, we can, uh, uh, given the inertia, compute the stiffness, which is 10, uh, that we set to the Kp, and the damping uh, that uh, we said, uh, again, this is an error, uh, it should be uh, 2 square root of uh, Kpi, before it was m. Now we are in a rotational joint, so we we are uh, talking about inertia. And, uh, and the setting is true, we are able to, uh, we will see if we simulate that the system is behaving with, uh, is getting to the reference in two seconds. Um, but what happens whenever we move out from the horizontal plane? Whenever we move out from the horizontal plane, we will have gravity. So, uh, we need to take gravity into account uh, in our dynamics. And here, for example, it's a joint like the, the one you find in the lab that are uh, moving in the, in the vertical plane. And you see that each position, the gravity will have a different, uh, a different value because If you are like this, gravity like that. If you are like this, the arm, the, the torque that the gravity does on the on the on the axis of the joint, it's smaller. Yeah. It becoming zero whenever the joint is vertical and the gravity goes through the axis. Because the torque is given by the lever that the force as with respect to rotation of the axis. So the axis of rotation. Um, so we have a, a configuration dependent term and uh, um, we have a, a inertia plus gravity equal to torque. Um, and we see that if we use a PD controller at equilibrium, uh, we start to have a problem because we will have a steady state error. Again, we set uh, uh, um, acceleration to zero, uh, velocity to zero, and we see that uh, uh, we get J uh, tau um, equal to Kp uh, theta d minus tau, uh, so theta d minus theta. And uh, um, this means that uh, the, 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 the position the, the joint arrives, uh, it's uh, the exact position minus uh, an error that depends on the gravity that we call the um, steady state error uh, that prevents us to arrive to the, to the target. So this is what happens whenever you see the robot, for example, squatting a bit because you don't compensate gravity. So you have uh, a tracking error in your PD controller. So um, <coughs> if we apply a, a simple strategy that is called gravity compensation, we are able to have uh, zero error at equilibrium, so at steady state. So we just need to recompute uh, for each position of the link uh, different values of the gravity term, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, at equilibrium we will have uh, uh, 
zero steady state error. Uh, we still uh, have the, the stability uh, that is uh, determined by the previous of the gain. So this, this guy is not affecting stability at all. And, uh, uh, but this guy needs to be computed uh, each loop with the, configura the configuration of the robot. And means, this means that uh, we, we need to have a model of the system. An alternative for the lazy people is we have an integral action. Everything is clear until now. I'm too fast, I'm too slow. Please okay. give me feedback if, if, it, if it is okay. Or yes. Okay. You, you, you already know this, most of this stuff, or? It's more or less. Yeah. So just reviewing some, some, some parts. Uh, this, is, this is the flow of the story, and I'm trying to tell a story about what, 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 what where, where you will see where I want to arrive with this. So, uh, so we are lazy, we want to add a, uh, an integral action, because we don't have the model, uh, it's too, too complex, I don't have the card, the, the technician doesn't give me the card, uh, I don't know, I need to provide the result for tomorrow. Uh, so I put uh, an integral action, and an integral action is something. It's a um, it's a part of the controller that uh, helps us to remove the steady state steady state errors in face of an unknown constant disturbances. So the, the disturbance must be constant. Gap is constant, more or less. Let's say it's not super time varying. So it, it works also with with, with gravity. Um, Actually, you, you can have actually uh, some oscillations because gravity is changing with the configuration. But uh, let's say, let's say we, it, it, it's fair enough. Uh, another uh, situation you can have uh, is whenever you have uh, uh, an unknown payload and you want to uh, compensate for its weight, and its weight is always constant, um, or a constant disturbance, for example. Um, uh, a torque offset, so you have an offset in your sensor. Um, and uh, the control law, in the case of PID, we still have the P part, we still have the T part, and we are having an additional term that is proportional to the integral of the, tra of the, of the, of the tracking error. So we have desired the trajectory, actual, actual, the desired uh, reference point and uh, actual position, and we compute the error, and we integrate through time. So if the error remains the same, this means that this term grows with time, grows so much that we create, we overcome eventually the other two, and we create a big torque. And unless the robot is stuck, the, the robot needs to move to reduce this error. Then it will happen that we overshoot. So it's always good to keep this term very small with respect to the other two, to avoid this problem. And we feel uh, we have uh, um, our dynamics with a constant disturbance plus gravity, so two different disturbances. Uh, we see that um, uh, at steady state, uh, if you apply this uh, this, uh, this control over here, um, we have uh, acceleration and velocity equal to zero. So we have uh, uh, g plus disturbance force equal to kpe the error plus k uh, ki the integral of the error. If we differentiate once, we get uh, that the dynamics of the error goes to zero. So uh, we, we, we know that the integral action is it's removing the steady state error. So at the end, we know that we, with a constant disturbance, we will have uh, zero, zero error. Um, and this is what they say, that the, the integral component part close modifying the error until the disturbance is compensated. Um, this is an experiment we did, for example, the putting loads on the robot, or as I say, the constant top force. It's not good to use integral action with, uh, with the to overcome Coulomb frictions because Coulomb friction depends on the velocity. We see uh, it changes sign, so it is constant, but it's, it's changing sign continuously with the with the with the motion. So uh, integral action can bring two oscillations.
now uh, we till now we talked about one degree of freedom robot. Uh, quite boring. Uh, why? Because there are no interactions, so we can use a decentralized controller, very simple. There are no problems in essence. Um, but whenever we go to two degrees of freedom robot or more, we still we start to have uh, some uh, problems in terms of the uh, interactions and of the, the way the dynamics looks like. So I took this, um, the simplest robot ever, um, and we analyze its uh, dynamics in detail. So uh, first, let, let's take the simplest robot ever, which is like, uh, two prismatic joints on a plane, on a, on, a, on, a, on a plane, so perpendicular to gravity, no gravity, and they are located at 90 degrees. If this is what, for example, uh, in a gantry, a 2D gantry, in a warehouse, 2D gantry robot is. And we have prismatic joint at 90 degrees, and the, 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 um, the vector of, uh, of, uh, of joint coordinates is called Q in robotics. We, we always use this notation. And in this case, has two elements Q1, which is the position of this joint, and Q2, that is the position of the other one. And uh, uh, each joint has a, 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 an input, equation, force this time, because we are talking about linear, uh, linear joints. So we have, we have forces as input, and we have linear accelerations as outputs. And the link after the first joint has a mass m1, and the link after the second joint has a mass m2. And the dynamics is very nice, block diagonal. We see that the first, uh, this is the, the dynamic equation of the first uh, joint, um, and it needs to uh, carry both the masses of the first and the second one, uh, sec first and second link, while the second joint has only to carry out the mass of the second link. And there are no inertia coupling, and these masses are constant. So quite easy, a little bit compli more complicated than before because the first joint uh, needs to move two masses, <laughs> just only one. Uh, what happens if the, if the joints are not are, um, 90 degrees, uh, the thing gets complex and the matrix, the inertia matrix becomes dense. Its elements still are constant, but we have off element terms. This means that there are inertia coupling, uh, inertia coupling and uh, the motion of one joint, uh, for example, uh, this one, is affected by the motion of the second joint, of the other joint. In particular, if you take the first line, you see that um, this is the, the, the force that the first joint needs to do, and is affected by the uh, acceleration of motion of the first link, plus uh, uh, another acceleration coming from the second. Um, if, we, if we increase the complexity and we go to revolute joints, uh, the thing gets worse. But uh, the constants, M1, 2 and M2, they are supposed to be equal or because it should be symmetric? Or yes, 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 good point, good point. Yes, the national matrix is symmetric, so the, the, the octagonal terms are equal. Whenever we have um, uh, revolute joints, um, uh, we have to consider other forces, other influences uh, that come from the uh, Coriolis and uh, effects. Uh, in particular, um, we have uh, one rotational joint uh, uh, that moves the link M1 uh, with a central mass located here. This is the axis of the rotational joint, so it's a two degrees of freedom uh, robot with two rotational joints. The first one is this, and the second one is this. We have two links. One of M1 and 2 and the inertia matrix looks like this. And we have these two, uh, 
we are, we are, we are on, the, on the vertical plane, so this time we have gravity affecting. And uh, uh, we have this term that is uh, represent the correlation centrifugal force that uh, we can express as a C matrix uh, dependent on position and velocity of the joints times the, uh, the velocity vector. While the gravity torques, as we uh, saw before, only depends on the position, on the configuration of the joints. And these two terms can be uh, merged into a term H that people call bias forces. So uh, how do we compute the gravity torque? Gravity torque is, is, is quite simple. Um, we um, consider the location of the central mass, and we know that at each uh, the central mass of each link, we have uh, a gravity force applied, and we compute the effect of this gravity force on the torque of the joint two and of the joint one. So the joint one will have to withstand two. Um, two links, so with uh, a bigger gravity torque, while the second joint uh, we'll, we'll see only the cross product between uh, uh, the location of the central mass and the gravity torques of the uh, gravity force of the second uh, link. And uh, uh, this is how you express the, the, the cross product explicitly. Uh, you see here that uh, because of the cosine uh, uh, Q1 and Q2, uh, we have that the gravity is position dependent. Uh, one, if you look at the inertia matrix, uh, we see, uh, as we say, that uh, it's symmetric, uh, it's positive definite. This means that all the aggregate values are positive, and that also configuration dependent. So even the, uh, in case of attention on joint, regular joint, even the um, uh, inertia matrix is configuration dependent. The only term that, that doesn't depend on the position is, is this one, because the last link uh, uh, see always the, the inertia, so the last joint see the inertia of the last link, and it doesn't change. While depending on the configuration, uh, for example, the, the first link, uh, uh, the first joint see, the, uh, depending on the configuration of the robot, different inertia. In particular, whenever the arm is completely extended, the inertia will be the highest. Whenever it's completely retracted, it will be the lowest. Um, sorry about the color, this should be this term. Uh, the influence, uh, uh, this, this represents the influence uh, uh, from joint two on joint one. And if we think uh, how this influence looks like, uh, think about the completely extended joint, uh, and you see that moving this, this joint uh, will have uh, uh, a big uh, influence on the, on the first one, while if it's 90 degrees, uh, the, the influence will be, will be smaller, and uh, we, can, we can plot uh, the influence of this, this second joint on the first one uh, according to the configuration. We see that it's non linear. Uh, in terms of uh, centrifugal torques, uh, to understand them, we uh, consider uh, the rotation, of, um, how the rotation of a link affects uh, the first, the first joint and the second uh, joint. So, uh, if you think uh, rotating about rotating this uh, second link, uh, we have a centrifugal force. And this centrifugal force uh, will have no effect on the second link, but uh, will have uh, a component that uh, creates a torque on the first link. So we have an influence on tau one, and this influence is maximum whenever the, the, the joint is a 90 degree, and uh, we have no effect on, on tau two. Instead, if we move uh, uh, link one, uh, if we move link one, we have a, a centrifugal force uh, 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 acting like this on the, on the second link, uh, while the first link uh, we have uh, a line. So we have no influence on tau one, but we have influence on tau two because 
uh, this component uh, will have we create a token voucher. Uh, quarterly stores are uh, quite tricky and they are related to uh, the change of uh, tangential velocity whenever the distance from the rotation axis changes. So think about the, you are on a, on a rotating platform and you move away from the axis. You will see an apparent uh, uh, force that uh, uh, it's uh, accelerating the um, uh, right because uh, you are supposed here to have a, a, a bigger tangential velocity than here. And this, uh, uh, the fact that you don't have, uh, you are not changing this, this, this velocity, but you're supposed to have it, it shows up as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an apparent force that, uh, that makes you fall on the right side. Um, and uh, if we uh, think about the robot, uh, um, we see that uh, um, if we uh, move uh, the second joint, we change uh, the uh, distance uh, uh, from the rotation axis in the first joint. And so we will see this uh, uh, core release force that will affect both the first joint and the second joint. So um, um, if uh, there is no motion of the second joint, whatever ha the, the distance from the rotation axis of the first joint will be also the same, and there will be no release. However, if the first joint is not moving at all, also there is no uh, release effect. So FC is quite complex and depends on both the velocity, uh, the rotation velocity of joint one and joint two, and also affect both both torques. So it means that if we look at the centrifugal uh, effect, uh, we have a cable, uh, as we said, uh, the centrifugal force uh, on tau one depends on the on the position of tau two, and of tau two uh, uh, depends on the position of uh, the, uh, Q2, sorry. And uh, the correlates are, um, are dense. And uh, uh, this means that if we sum up the two effect, the C matrix is dense and depends both on uh, uh, the position and the velocity because the correlates part depends on the velocity and the centrifugal part depends on the position. And if we put everything together, we have the dynamic equation of the uh, two degrees of freedom robot with the uh, level of joints. We have the inertia matrix position dependent, uh, configuration dependent, the Coriolis matrix configuration dependent, the Coriolis, and the gravity also configuration dependent. In addition, the M matrix and the C matrix, they are dense, so they have coupings. And uh, if you use a PD or um, we have PID, we are able to bring uh, the steady state data to zero. So everything works nice in theory from the, uh, at the steady state, uh, but during the transient, we can have uh, a very bad behavior because of uh, the scoping. In particular, if we set two different uh, step references uh, in different moments to the first and the second joint, we will see that because of this coupling, uh, the first, uh, the motion of the second joint will affect the first one, while uh, um, the motion of the, uh, sorry, the first, the, it's a swap, uh, while the motion of the other joint will affect the first one. Everything is clear? Do you have questions? Okay. So this is an example taken from the classes of uh, Katib, Osama Katib, uh, for us to use a freedom robot. We have the explicitly um, expressed the, the C matrix and the Coriolis term vector and uh, the gravity. And uh, we see that um, this coupling shows up uh, as something dependent on the second joint 
uh, affecting the first joint equation and something coming from the first joint affecting the second joint equation. And this is what uh, um, it happens whenever you have a decentralized uh, approach, which means that we care with our controller PD, PID, only uh, of, of one glucose group on one joint, discarding any influence coming from, from the other. So if we close the loop on the first joint, we will see that this um, this, this uh, influence from the second joint will create a tracking error, and if you close the loop on the second joint, uh, we see that the uh, influence from coming from the first joint will create uh, a tracking error. And uh, uh, what uh, uh, people uh, that are not expert in control do, they just crank up the gains. Okay, I will increase the gains, and uh, who cares? I will reduce the influence coming from the other joint. Uh, it is true, it is true, uh, it's an option, but it's not uh, the best option. Why? Uh, in theory, the, the system is still stable because we are thinking about, uh, um, um, uh, again, a PD controller, let's say, with a uh, uh, virtual spin damper, so as soon as we uh, this time, instead of positive uh, gains, we, we are talking about uh, gain matri matrix. Uh, so this matrix should be positive deficit. So as long as they are positive deficit, it's still a second order system, and everything should be stable. But uh, this time we have dependencies on the on the uh, on the joint uh, configuration. So uh, the system is not linear. Uh, and to prove the stability, you need to kind of do uh, more tricky adaptive analysis. But still, you can do. So uh, why don't just crank up the gains and uh, we don't care about the interactions? However, the system is not second order. There are many, many uh, model things uh, that are in the real system. So if you do in simulation, everything works. When you turn the robot, the, the, the system gets horribly stable, unstable. And why? Because there are flexibilities uh, in the joints, so the, the joints are not perfectly rigid, and it creates uh, a model dynamics, first order dynamics. So the system is no longer second order, but it's much higher. That affects the stability. Um, additionally, if you crank up the gains, the, the robot becomes very rigid. So whenever it gets in contact, uh, it, can, uh, um, it, can, it can break, it can, it can, it can, it can damage. Uh, it, it's not good to, 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 for interaction. And uh, so an, an idea would be to, um, that people had to uh, use nonlinear state feedback uh, to cancel out this uh, inertial coupling, this coupled dynamics of the manipulator, and achieve uh, a linearized system, a system with linear that we can control with whatever gains we want. In particular, we want low gains because we want to be soft, we want to be uh, user-friendly, we want to be compliant, we want to uh, don't break the robot, whenever something goes wrong, um, and still achieve a good, a good tracking. And this is actually uh, coming to the last part of this, uh, this section, that is inverse dynamics. Uh, before talking about inverse dynamics, we do a little um, a little uh, recall on uh, feedback linearization. That is the basis uh, uh, behind uh, inverse dynamics. So the idea of feedback linearization is that whenever you have a nonlinear system with an input and a state-dependent term, say. Uh, you can define a control action that is, is um, uh, setting an input such that uh, you invert the dynamics. So you define a new control input, and if you, uh, if you uh, re replace this uh, into you, you find a system that is uh, a single integrate. Did you, did you see this? 
Yeses. So. You have uh, your dynamics. Place control action like this. Then you get V minus V X plus V X this goes away and you achieve X dot equal to V which is a, a single integrator with input V and output This we get equal x equal to integrator of the dt. Okay. Um, so um, if you have a model of the system from CAD values, for example, CAD, um, we can create a schematic tree and with all the masses and central masses, inertia, and create a model of the system. Then we are able to compensate the nonlinearities and uh, achieve a linear system. Uh, that is the coupling, because we can cancel all the uh, nonlinearities and interactions, and we, we achieve a decoupled system. This means that any input of the system has an influence only on uh, on uh, on uh, one output. This means, for example. <laughs> In the case of our uh, GPU the robot, we have V1, V2, and this is Q1, Q2. And V1 will have an influence on Q1, and V2 will have an influence on V1. And we can use a decentralized uh, approach to design the controller. Um, in particular, we can set whatever controller, because now we have a very simple uh, system. Um, however, the problem with inverse dynamics is that you're not able to perfect, achieve a perfect translation of the, of the dynamics, because you can have model inaccuracies. And uh, uh, so this is a drawback. So people never do. Um, Inverse dynamics alone, they always have a feedback uh, controller as well, together with inverse dynamics. And uh, uh, for articulated robot, uh, the second order system, the feedback generalization is called inverse dynamics. And uh, uh, this means that um, uh, we have accelerations and we compute the torques uh, to, to achieve a certain, uh, certain motion. And uh, while the forward dynamics is, though, is, is usually the other way, the other way around, which means from torques we, we want to compute the, the, the motion, the acceleration. And the forward dynamics is mainly used in simulator, while the inverse dynamics is used in controllers. So if you have, uh, if you're doing the same uh, with our dynamic equation, <coughs> we know that H is, is bias forces, so Coriolis um, and gravity, and centrifugal and Coriolis and gravity. And we set a uh, torque uh, that has this uh, shape, uh, control of it this, this, this way. Um, and we replace it to here. We see that the H10 goes away. And we have, um, sorry, this should be a V. Um, we have Q dot dot equal to V. And we have a system that is linearized. This time it's a, it's a double integrator. Um, 
because uh, we are relative to degree two, uh, from the input view. And we can set uh, the input view v to have, uh, for example, to have a, uh, to be a, a PD controller with the uh, PID forward. Um, and if we set this, uh, uh, this control law on the new input v, uh, we get, uh, we, we can achieve a perfect tracking uh, with the decentralized, decentralized controller. So in here we can uh, um, uh, show the comparison of, of uh, a PD controller with low gains. And you see that you have a big tracking error because you have low gains and there are uh, influence uh, due to the, to, the, to the other joints in particular here. This is supposed to have uh, constant reference and, the, and this joint is it's moving because of the motion of the other two. While with inverse dynamics, with the same low gains, we achieve a perfect tracking because we eliminate completely the, uh, the coupling. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is some, these are optional um, slides about uh, an electrical analogy uh, of, of all the components. The damper is a resistor. The, the mass uh, is equivalent to uh, inductance. They, in essence, they follow the same differential equation. While the spring, it's equivalent to a capacitor. This is just for for your interest. Okay, if you have. Any question? Otherwise, we can uh, do a quick break. What do you think? Okay. So, five minute break, ten minutes break.